So good afternoon. <coughs> As uh, Dr. Roy said was mentioning, I am from material science, and I think uh, probably all of you are from mechanical engineering. There's a few material science. Material here. science also. Yeah, okay. Okay, so both my bachelor's and master's degree were in mechanical engineering. So probably my talk will be a mixture of both mechanical engineering and material science engineering. So uh, as this class is based on additive manufacturing, so I used AM. I even did not use additive manufacturing <laughs> in my title. So I hope you are all familiar with additive manufacturing process. So uh, what's great about additive manufacturing? why we should be studying or we should do research on additive manufacturing. Design freedom and you can use less material mm -hmm. overall. So you can ma manufacture probably very complex components. So here are a few examples. My view is not working. Okay, now it works. <laughs> yeah, so these are the uh, complex components that you are talking about. And um, wide range of applications from different industries. But if that is the thing, uh, you have so many applications, then how do you justify this? Uh, the global value, uh, global market value of additive manufacture components are very less compared to traditional manufacturing. So uh, where is the problem? The problem is additive manufacturing process itself is very, very complex. So there are a lot to be understood yet. So in my talk, I will talk about all of those uh, underlying physical phenomena that makes this process very complex. And how uh, transport phenomena based model, that is the heat, mass and momentum transfer based model, can help us to understand uh, some of the uh, physical phenomena in additive manufacturing. So as you all know that uh, Additive manufacturing is based on uh, primarily based on the interaction between heat source and feedstock <coughs> material. Depending on which process you are using, uh, the heat source can be a laser, arc, electron beam, and the feedstock could be wear or powder. So here is a typical example of uh, interaction between laser and powder. So it's a powder feedstock. So uh, locally, the pow uh, powders are melted by the heat heat source, and then. Uh, heat is being transferred in different directions through conduction, convection, and radiation. And then when it solidifies, it uh, gives us the required shape and size of the component. So everything actually starts uh, from the heat absorption. When you switch on your laser or electron beam, how heat is absorbed by the feedstock material. So uh, here, this example is typically for uh, direct energy deposition, laser-based direct energy deposition, where uh, the laser is coaxial to the nozzle of the powder feeder. And uh, there are two uh, types of heat absorption for this kind of process. One is when the powder particles <coughs> are flowing from the nozzle to the top of the substrate. During their flight, they absorb some heat and the remaining heat is absorbed when they already reach the substrate and that's how they melt and uh, then after that they solidify to uh, make the component. But as I mentioned, the process is itself is complex and it has so many uh, process conditions. So if you change one of the process conditions a little bit, uh, the final uh, structure and properties of your component will be completely different. And depending on that, sometimes you will have defect, sometimes you will not have defect. But um, when we melt the pool, uh, when we melt the material, we form a molten pool. How hot the molten pool is. So I have put a bunch of different examples starting from boiling water that we can probably <coughs> touch and little bit burn our finger. From that to the surface of sun, this is unbelievable. I mean, all material would technically vaporize. So the range of temperature that we are interested in is somehow between uh, those those two extreme temperatures. It's depending on the alloy, it's the uh, melting point to boiling point of the alloy. Um, now there are several alloys uh, whose melting point is very less, like aluminum alloy. And there are many alloys like titanium alloys, tungsten, tungsten based alloys. Uh, their melting point is melting point and boiling points are fairly very high. So, uh, you know, 
what happens if you create the molten pool that hot molten pool is just like your coffee cup water bubbles or no water particles in form of vapor they come out <laughs> from the coffee pot same thing happens in case of molten pool these alloys are having many many constituting elements and those elements vaporize from the molten pool and not all alloying elements vaporize at the same rate because their boiling points are also different so depending on the selective rate of vaporization at the end when you make the component the chemical composition of the component is significantly different from what we start with like the powder powder feedstock so uh, same thing you can observe also in welding and this is very very well established in welding literature especially by professor de broy uh, here i have put one example from welding literature laser welding of aluminum alloy where you can see a significant drop in chemical composition after the welding <coughs> this is one thing the other thing is inside the molten pool the temperature is not uniform near the laser beam axis the temperature is the highest and the uh, at the periphery of the molten pool that is the solidus temperature of the alloy so uh, as we know from high school physics that surface tension is a function of temperature at high temperature surface tension is less right so if we plot that just to uh, remind you that if this is the surface tension and this is temperature for almost all alloys it follows this trend so technically if this is a cross section of the molten pool this region is of the highest temperature and in this region you have the solidus temperature of the alloy so surface tension is high here and low here by following this graph and because of the high surface tension near the periphery of the molten pool it pulls the liquid from the center so you will see a recirculatory motion inside the molten pool other thing inside the molten pool since the temperature is different the density is also different so hot metal will go up because of its <coughs> low density cold metal will go down because of its high density but the surface tension driven force force is much more dominant compared to buoyancy force like density driven force and why we should uh, study this kind of things because uh, we should not care what's going on inside the molten pool because this kind of flow inside the molten pool actually dominates the heat transfer mechanism inside the molten pool and surrounding that surrounding to that so if we are interested in uh, knowing that what should be the cooling rate or what should be the final deposit shape and size this kind of phenomena we should study so geometry cooling rate heating rate microstructure and property whatever we are interested in we should consider this kind of effect that is called mayangoni convection and when i will talk about the modeling part i will also uh, mention how to model this kind of phenomena so to simply explain uh, what is the surface tension effect or marangoni effect i have put a uh, very funny video where they did some kind of very <coughs> simple experiment that you can do in your home oh no the marangoni effect says that fluid will want to flow from areas of lower surface tension to areas of higher surface tension we can see an example of the marangoni effect by adding pepper to water. There's soap on the end of this cotton swab. Watch what happens when the cotton swab is put into the water. The pepper flakes move away from the point where we added the soap. So in this case, if you add this uh, soap, it will break the surface tension and it will do that marangoni flow here. But for our case in additive manufacturing, it is uh, because of the temperature difference. So basically it flows inside. Okay. Now the next question is what is the velocity of flow? So I have, I have also put two extremes. One is uh, uh, the cartwheel that uh, gymnast do. Okay. So probably the velocity is how much? One meter per second. And from that 
we can take the other extreme, Usain Bolt is sprinting. Okay, in Olympic. So he can probably cover uh, 100 meters in 10 seconds, pretty fast. So the molten pool uh, convective flow, the flow of molten metal inside the molten pool, my video is not working, sorry. So this flow is also the uh, magnitude of that velocity is also in that order of magnitude, comparable to those two examples. So now let's go inside the physics and let's <coughs> understand mathematically how it happens. So that when I will explain the modeling part, we can appreciate uh, the science part of it. So as I mentioned that uh, this kind of phenomena is very common for commonly, uh, commonly used alloys like steel or any iron based alloys, where uh, the uh, gradient of surface tension with respect to temperature is negative, what we studied in high school physics. But if you add in steel, if you add a little bit of sulfur, it will act as a surface active element that will completely change what we learned in high school physics. So instead of having a negative slope, now we will have something like increasing and then decreasing slope, depending on temperature range. So if your temperature is in this region, where uh, the surface tension increases with temperature, then the direction of flow will be just the opposite. Instead of radially outward, it will be now radially inward. <coughs> okay, so uh, what is the effect of that? So when it is radially outward, it is making the molten pool much wider. But if this is radially inward, it is making the molten pool not that much wide, but deeper. <coughs> I can give you some example for welding where people have observed this kind of phenomena. So this is also from uh, Professor Dugger's <coughs> work in early 1990s. So this is a well, this is a laser welding of uh, stainless steel where you can see that um, if you increase the amount of sulfur, you change the direction of flow and uh, on your right, it's the radially inward flow that makes the molten pool deeper. And Professor Debroy developed a model to capture this. And you can see the right hand side of those experimental image. You can see the calculated results that agree with the modeling result. So um, this is the important phenomenon. And depending on that kind of convective flow, depending on which alloy you are using and what kind of surface active element you have, your molten pool can look very funny sometimes. Sometimes it can be like W, sometimes it, it can have deep penetration with two types of convective flow inside and uh, different others. You can go to the literature and find many, many different kinds of uh, shape and size of molten pool. So what is the end result? We have so many uh, dif difficult uh, uh, physics involved. What is the end result? And uh, you know, we have different additive manufacturing processes also. And depending on what kind of uh, process parameter we are using, what kind of alloy we are using, everything makes the thing so messy. So we call additive manufacturing is so diverse process and we need to learn a lot. Here is some example. So temperature gradient <coughs> and growth rate, I'm going back to the material science, uh, temperature gradient and growth rate during solidification are two most important things that decide whether uh, your solidification morphology will be columnar or equiaxed. That is a very well established knowledge in casting and also applicable in welding and additive manufacturing. And we can see that depending on which process you are using like powder bed fusion, D, D, uh, D, D gas metal arc, these values could be several order of magnitude different. So depending on which process you are using, same alloy can give you sometime columnar drain rate, sometime equiax drain rate. And so the microstructure is so different, the hardness, one of the very primitive mechanical property, that can also be very different depending on which process you are using. So how to control this diversity? Most important question. You know, Long time ago, when people did not have any good tool to measure things, then uh, common people always 
uh, where used to go to professors. Now also they go, but that time also they went. So one of the very uh, good <laughs> examples that happened in India long time ago, people were interested to know what is the height of Mount Everest. You know Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. So they went to a professor and the professor said, Dr. Sigdar, he said that I have a tool called trigonometry. I can use that and calculate by sitting at my home what is the height of Mount Everest. Now time has been changed. Now this is 2019. We still ask same kind of question. And the answer is same. We need to calculate. And for calculation, we develop mechanistic model. And this is my PhD topic. So after that, whatever slides I will show, very close to my heart. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mechanistic model of 3D printing is used to calculate all of these complex things that you can observe during the process. How the temperature field looks like, how the cooling rates will be, uh, whether the component will form defect or not, how will be the microstructure, solidification texture, or um, thermomechanical stuff like residual stress and distortion. So after my talk, Dr. Denlinger will talk more about these kind of things. So all of these things will start by solving three equations. Conservation equations of mass, momentum, and energy. Conservation of mass, you know in your fluid mechanics book as continuity equation. Momentum conservation equation, you know as Navier-Stokes equation and energy conservation equation as Fourier's equation. So uh, here I have put one typical example where uh, <coughs> it looks like DED, laser beam and powder feedstock. And what the model does, it takes the process parameters and material property and calculate bunch of different things. How difficult these models are? <coughs> it takes decades to develop, but when you run, it's not that crazy. I, I'll give one example. Let's say you are simulating 10 centimeter build. Okay. We divide it uh, for ap to apply the numerical techniques. We divide it uh, typically uh, 250,000 cells. And uh, since we are calculating temperature and velocity fields, we solve for velocity, pressure, and uh, three components of velocity, pressure, and enthalpy based on which we calculate temperature, like enthalpy equal to Cp times T. So then you have five components, you are solving for 250,000 cells, 1.25 million algebraic equations. And we know additive manufacturing is a continuous process. We divide it, it by different time steps to simulate it as a continuous process. So let's say uh, 100 iteration per time step and there are 1,000 time steps. So when you solve for just 10 centimeter case, you are solving at the end 125 billion equations. Now guess how long time does it take? Couple days. Any other guess? 10 minutes. Exactly, you are right. <laughs> <laughs> After 10 minutes, you will get the complete picture of everything. Temporarily and uh, specially varying temperature fluid field, uh, fluid flow inside the molten pool, cooling rates, whatever you need, you can get. For example, this result is also obtained in 10 minutes, probably less than that. This is for 6 millimeter uh, long and 5 layers deposit. Once again, my animation did not work. Yes. So uh, these are the typical results that you obtain from the model. And the thing to understand that, you know, laser beam travels during the process. It moves up to deposit the uh, higher layers and all. So uh, the temperature field, depending on where do you have your laser beam, temperature field is very, very non-uniform specially, and it is also transient. And uh, based because of this kind of so much uh, varying temperature field, the cooling rate <coughs> in the same component is very different. So based on cooling rate, microstructure and property of the same component can vary significantly. So I just took some snippets from that animation and uh, try to show that how molten pool looks like uh, for different layers and at different distance. So as you go up and deposit more layers, that means you are going far away from the substrate. Okay. 
So just imagine you have a gas burner, okay, and you are cooking something very, very uh, far away from the burner. It will not be cooked, right, because of the heat difficulty in heat transfer. So same thing happens from the molten pool. Molten pool is the source of heat. When it goes far, far away from the substrate, it cannot contact heat through the substrate. So it starts accumulating more and more heat and starts expanding. So you can see that with number of layers, molten pool size is increasing. And not only that, where how it is increasing, it also depends, it also changes based on which alloy you are using and what is your process condition. For example, there are two examples. One is for 190 watt and right side is for 230 watt. More power means you are depositing more heat, right? So your molten pool will increase. That is very common sense. You can see that here. Uh, that, for example, we have 1.4 millimeter to 1.72 millimeter. It is increasing. But what happens if we compare different alloys? So among these three alloys, steel, <coughs> titanium alloy, nickel base alloy, which one has the lowest density? Any guess? Minus 64. Sorry about that. The titanium? Titanium, right. So when you have a low density, that means if your heat input is same, you are melting more material. Right, because for same volume, your mass is less, because density is less. So because of that, you can see the titanium, uh, the molten pool size of titanium is higher than other two alloys. So we are adding one more complexity, alloy properties. And uh, since the uh, temperature field is so much variable, uh, the peak temperature also changes. As you can see, during the same process, uh, we, have, we are depositing nine layers and monitoring temperature near the substrate. <coughs> you can see when it's depositing the layer one, the temperature monitor there is very high and when it's going up at the same location the temperature recorded are gradually going down and it is true wherever you monitor like for example you are monitoring near the substrate near layer one for this one you are monitoring near layer two so on and so forth <coughs> so you can see that the peak temperature is not constant Depending on your monitoring location, it, ch it may change. And depending on the where you are monitoring locations are, which uh, layer you are depositing, your peak temperature recorded also change. This is for one component. If you make, this sev uh, sev if you make several components with different process conditions, you can see peak temperature also change. So if you increase laser power, that means you are depositing more heat, you are increasing temperature. Very intuitive, but very important. So what we, what we do with those temperature fields? You know, if we can plot temperature versus time diagram, like last figure, we will see like this. So this part is for cooling, right? So we can understand how a component cools down. So as we know that uh, depending on how it cools down, uh, how it solidifies and how it cools down, depending on that microstructure develops. So uh, if we can know the cooling rate, we plug in some value that we knew from casting literature or welding literature, and then we can get the secondary <coughs> round spacing of columnar dendrites. So what is that? Let's say these are the dendrites, columnar dendrites, and these are their secondary arms. So spacing between these arms. Why these are important? Because if you have columnar dendrites, depending on the size of the arm spacing, your mechanical property will be different. So here is a mean uh, to know what will be the average size. It is not that perfect because secondary arm spacing also change very uh, significantly depending on uh, where you are looking at but uh, you can get some rough idea about this kind of thing. So if your laser power increases, that means you are making your pool very big. Okay. 
So now tell me one thing, if you have a very big molten pool and you have a very small molten pool, which one will cool faster? The big one. Big one? Or the smaller one? If I'm faster, I think is the better. You mean the smaller one? I, no, I think... Are I they the same temperature? No, not, not at all. So the bigger one, if it's higher temperature in the middle, has a larger like driving force mm. yeah. for heat to go away to get to the equilibrium. Mm. Just imagine like this, for casting, you have a very big billet, and you have very thin component you cast. Which one will cool down to the room temperature faster? The small one. Small. small. So same thing is applicable for molten pool. Smaller molten pool will cool down. I, thought I was thinking more along term along the lines of a cooling rate on the outside versus the inside. Hmm. <coughs> temperature gradient step. at some point of time right. will be different, right. but the uh, how the overall component will cool down mm -hmm. to the room temperature, the smaller one. Mm -hmm. So uh, that means, uh, you know, for higher laser power, you are making more big, bigger molten pool that will cool down very slowly. And when something cools down very slowly, it will allow the grain to grow. So the secondary dendritic arm spacing will be bigger. Okay. How we can utilize this information? Go back to our material science fundamentals, Callister book. We are very familiar to this equation that is called Holpage equation. Right. So where we put the grain size and we know what will be the yield strength. Okay. So here it's a modified version of whole page equation where <coughs> instead of grain size, we are putting the arm spacing of secondary dendrite. And we are getting the yield strength and then plugging in this conversation equation, we are getting micro hardness value. Now these constants are uh, definitely alloy dependent, so we need to go to the handbook and find out the value for the value of these constants for that particular alloy. But uh, what is important is the utility and the science it is bringing in. For example, if you deposit more heat per unit length by increasing the laser power or arc power, you are pulling down, you, you are slowing down the cooling rate and allowing grains to grow and that eventually reducing your hardness. So depending on what kind of mechanical property you, are, you, are, you want, you need to adjust your process condition and you will not do those by doing thousands of experiments because additive manufacturing is very, very expensive, both <coughs> the machine and the material, and it takes long time. So if you have that means to know how your mechanical property will be before doing the experiments, it will be something helpful. So here it, this is. And uh, the cooling rate and micro hardness I am talking about that is also not uniform in a component. It also changes in, a same comp in the same component. So when you are going up, same thing, you are having bigger molten pool, as I have mentioned, because of the heat transfer through the substrate. And bigger molten pool is difficult. It takes longer time to cool down. And uh, that you can see from the left figure. And uh, the micro hardness also goes down as you go up. So it is experimentally proven that uh, the micro hardness of a additively manufactured compound near the substrate is much higher compared to if you go up. Now, here is the utility of including um, fluid flow in our calculation. So as I, I, I was mentioning that if you uh, consider the effect of fluid flow, it will give you much more accurate temperature field and thus the cooling rate and the hardness. So. Here, this model means it considers both heat conduction as well as fluid flow effect inside the molten pool. So see, uh, it agrees reasonably well with the experimentally observed data. But if you neglect the effect of fluid flow and just solve the heat conduction equation, it will give you bad results. Why? Because Heat conduction calculations only, like if you use, let's say, ANSYS or Abacus and do very simple calculations of heat conduction by solving Fourier's equation. They are really, really useful. 
but uh, they are sometimes erroneous because uh, they do not consider the mixing of hot and cold liquid uh, that will give you some <coughs> error in cooling rate calculations. But those kind of models are very, very useful if you are calculating bulk properties like residual stresses and distortion. Where what is going on inside the molten pool is not that important. So as I was mentioning that uh, temperature gradient and growth rate, they are important to know uh, how uh, your uh, solidification morphology will be, whether it is equiaxial or columnar grains. So everything uh, yeah, depends on how you are calculating um, temperature field. But uh, how do you know those things intuitively? And how you can explain those uh, in a manner that people can realize? So to explain that, there is a number from physics book, it's called Fourier's number. So Fourier's number is a ratio between rate of heat dissipation to the rate of heat storage. That means when you have a molten pool, how fast heat is dissipating for that, from that molten pool and how much heat per unit time it is storing inside of it. So the ratio of these two rates is called Fourier's number. So high Fourier number, that means faster rate of heat dissipation. And faster rate of dissipation means faster cooling. That's why you can see that cooling rate follows a linear trend with Fourier's number. So if you are very, very interested to know about this kind of numbers from physics book, how we can apply that in additive manufacturing and reveal some of the underlying physics, you can probably go to this paper and uh, see more dimensionless numbers. Okay, now uh, up to that point of time, I was just talking about some intuitive things like, okay, what will happen if this is columnar grains or equiax grains? But is there any way to see by modeling, okay, this is my columnar grains, this is my equiax grains? Yeah, that is also possible. So depending on your G by R ratio, you can actually <laughs> use a uh, three-dimensional model um, that can give you uh, the columnar or equiax grains or morphologies in a component. For example, in the same component, this is a top view, and you can see this is the axis of the heat source, and uh, the G by R ratio is so different that in this region it forms columnar grains, but in this region it forms equiax grains. And that agrees very, very well with the corresponding experimental results. Although this is for gas tungsten arc welding, but same thing is applicable for additive manufacturing. I will give one example of additive manufacturing also. So how do you know if this is columnar grain, which direction it will follow during solidification? Again, G and R. So uh, let's say these are two temperature profile. I was talking about different temperature profiles before. So let's say these are two temperature profiles. And the laser axis is somewhere here where your temperature is the highest one. <coughs> and then if you take the gradient and then find out the angle that is the normal of that co temperature contour, that is the direction of maximum heat flow. And that is the direction along which columnar grains grow. There are exceptions, but that is the primary direction. So if we can just imagine these things uh, with the pro progress of the process, we can see from the top view that this is molten <laughs> pool at time equal to T1. Then molten pool is progressing in this direction as the laser beam or uh, arc heat source is progressing. You can see that depending on the normal to the local, uh, local position <coughs> of the molten pool, the columnar grains follow that direction and grow along that direction. So what if we capture this effect and develop a 3D model? It will look like this. What? That, you know, let's say you are depositing many, many layers. So these are the molten pools for a particular layer and it is going from this side to this side for all layers. So if you can know the shape of the molten pool or the temperature field adjacent to it, you can easily calculate the maximum heat flow direction, right? 
and then if you have the maximum heat flow direction you can predict along which direction grain will grow so i took this region zoom it in and these directions marked with yellow arrows is the direction of the maximum heat flow along which grain will grow and exactly it matches with experimental data for Inconel 718. Now what if I change it little bit instead of going in the same direction for first layer I will go from left to right and for second layer I will go from right to left. So molten pool will be different and if you take a normal <coughs> direction of normal for this molten pool is this but for the next layer the direction of normal is this then can you guess how the grain growth direction will be so this is the maximum heat flow direction for one layer and this is the maximum heat flow direction for next layer if the grain follows the direction of maximum heat flow direction how the grain will grow for this case like a zigzag exactly it will be zigzag and experimentally also people have found that it will be something like that but there are exceptions where sometime maximum heat flow direction is affected by the easy growth direction of the crystal depending on which alloy you are using and these things are for uh, cubic system like FCC or BCC now if you take very very complicated crystal system uh, like hexagonal close pack these things may not work so these are the snippets but how actually it grows to show that I have another animation the blue region is the molten pool and you can see for a particular time the grain that are growing at the trailing edge of the molten pool momentarily their direction of growth is perpendicular to the trailing edge of the molten pool and that's how layer by layer these columnar grains grow and at the end you will get the microstructure solidification texture and this is also very very non-uniform depending on where you are taking the section because you know let's say you have many many columnar grains contemplate that as sticks so if you hold bunch of sticks like that you will see oh these are my columnar grains okay but if you cut and look at this direction you may be mistaken considering them as equiax grains because you will see bunch of circles so you need to be very very careful how you are looking at your microstructure so to give some idea of this I have shown this one uh, where I took sections at three horizontal planes. So these distances are indicating how far you are from the top of the deposit. So on the top surface, it's very uh, easy to understand that these are column migrants, no doubt. But if you go in, it's like cutting all the sticks at the transverse section. These are looking like equiax grains, but they are not. That just the section of columnar grains. So if you do experiment and you cut the sample, polish it, spend a lot of time to characterize it, and then you conclude these are equiax grains. Actually, they are columnar grains. So what I'm saying that because these kind of models will give you some idea how the grains will look like. So that when you will go back to soft floor and do the experiment, you have that knowledge before that how your grains will look like. Then you will never be fooled. Yeah. So how does the simulation decide on like where a grain is seated? And then is it are those different colors actually orientations or are you just randomly assigning colors? Orientations. So these are done based on Monte Carlo based method. It's a statistical method. So uh, your first question was how do you know that from where the grains will grow? It depends on nucleus and size. So uh, these models assume that the nucleation is heterogeneous nucleation and it starts with some uh, statistically distributed nucleation sites. So th that depends on you, how would you define the statistical distribution. For this case, we have defined it as uh, Gaussian distribution. 
Okay, but there are much more rigorous model like face field models and model develops in University of Utah. They also can calculate nucleation exactly where you will have nucleation. We have Dr. Chen in material science department who has been working on face field model of nucleation and growth for this kind of things. So you can probably also see these papers. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Denlinger will talk about talk much more about calculation of residual space and distortion. But here I am giving a quick idea of distortion. If you want to calculate it, just like that. So you know, as we know that distortion depends on uh, process parameters, which material you are using, material properties, and many other, several other things like geometry and uh, other things. So if you want to know how much your component will distort before doing the experiment, you need to have some means that consider all of those things. One of the ways is very rigorous thermomechanical calculation using Abacus, ANSYS, or many other uh, commercial soft software packages. They are very, very useful. But all of them take really long time. Let's say you want to compare stainless steel component will distort more, or Inconel 718 component will distort more. How do you know that within five minutes? So to do that, in my PhD thesis, I proposed one number. It's called strain parameter. So it's a dimensionless representation of many process parameters and geometric effect and material properties. For example, beta is a material property. Heat input is process parameter. Flexural rigidity is coming from the geometry of the component. But one thing is uh, important to understand, these dimensionless number cannot give you the actual value of strain. So they are only useful if you want to compare between alloys or different process conditions. For example, I have taken strain data from literature of different alloys for different process conditions. Although they do not give uh, the same value, <coughs> but you can get the trend. That's very important. So that you can quickly figure out which alloy is more susceptible to distortion. Whether you should increase the power or decrease the power to reduce distortion. I'm comparing three alloys. So uh, who told that I64 has the highest, lowest density? I forget. Okay. So yeah, as we discussed, I64 has the lowest density, that means biggest molten pool. Now, you have a bigger casting, you have a smaller casting. Which one will have more distortion while solidification? The larger one. Larger one. Same thing is applicable here. If you have a bigger molten pool, it will distort the component more. So since Ti64 exhibits bigger molten pool, Ti64 component will exhibit higher distortion. That's evident from this picture. Also, I was talking about that cooking stuff you are going up and down all of those things, right? So if you are going, if, if you are depositing upper layers, your molten pool will increase its size because it is very difficult to transfer the heat from the molten pool to the substrate. So molten pool size will be bigger. Bigger molten pool shrinks more, as he is saying. So distortion will also increase as we deposit more layer. That is also evident. But then your question may be, what if I deposit 1,000 layer or 10,000 layer, 1 million layers? So that the uh, rate of increasing distortion will continue or it will stop after some time? Yes, it will stop after some time because temperature field will reach a steady state where the uh, heat transfer mechanism or heat transfer pattern will not change that much. So you will have a steady state temperature field and steady state molten pool size. Uh, same thing, I was using Fourier's number to explain cooling rate. I am bringing that number once again here to explain distortion. So intuitively, if you just get rid of your heat very quickly from the molten pool or from the component, is it good for distortion or bad for distortion? It's bad. 
let's say you have a casting somehow bigger casting somehow you find the mechanism to cool down quickly will it distort more or less i guess it'd be more local so it'd be less overall exactly overall it will be very less so you know fourier's number is in the denominator that means heat dissipation rate is in the denominator right so that means this region is high heat dissipation rate low distortion so that's how this kind of dimension less can give you some idea that you can realize from your insight it is not difficult science this defect is very uh, complex and many people are very worried about lack of fusion defect because if you have lack of fusion defect you need to just throw your component away completely useless sometimes you can probably recover it by doing heat or something like that but not that useful often so how would you predict whether your component will have defect or not as the name says lack of fusion lack of fusion between what between two adjacent layers that you are depositing if two adjacent layers are not fusing properly together then you will have that defect so that means if your molten pool is not remelting previously deposited layer you will have that defect <coughs> so your molten pool depth should be higher than layer thickness it should be more than one the more it will be is better for preventing lack of fusion for example if your heat input is high that means you are generating bigger molten pool or deeper molten pool that ensures a proper fusional bonding among layers so higher linear heat input that means your lf value that is this ratio is increasing and higher value of lf that is actually telling you that your porosity values or lack of fusion defect is actually decreasing so it's it is giving you some idea that how to control lack of fusion defect although not rigorous how to get much more rigorous if your component is made with not only with multiple layers but multiple hatches molten pool for one hatch <coughs> molten pool for second hatch first layer second layer so the white region here that indicates improper fusion among different hatches and layers it is giving you the um, indication of lack of fusion defect so let's say here you have first hatch and here you have second hatch you are putting them very far that means deliberately you are increasing the white space so you are increasing the lack of fusion defect so with increase in hatch spacing lack of fusion defect also increase now if you go very fast scan very fast so you are depositing more uh, less heat per unit time you are making your molten pool smaller you are deliberately once again increasing the void space so if you increase the speed you are also increasing the lack of fusion defect so these kind of calculations are the means to know a priori how much defect you will form okay complex stuff future oriented so let's say you have all these models what to do because uh, in many cases you will not have the idea that you can uh, represent based on physics you can only model if you know the physics if you do not know the physics how would you model you have no way right for example uh, porosity porosity may form because of lack of fusion may form due to entrapment of gas formation of keyhole many other things sometimes you do not know the physics what you will do one of the solutions that people are very very interested about including dr roy sel is application of machine learning right so what if we augment machine learning and mechanistic model <coughs> okay so the future concept is to make a digital twin white twin because in the digital environment it will be a replica of your 3d printing machine it will have many many building blocks like modeling machine learning big data analysis 
fundamentals of metallurgy, sensing and control data that we can capture during the experiment and use uh, their insights. So if we go at the crossroad of all of those things, we will know things much better. Where we know the physics, we will develop model and know about it. When we do not know the physics, we can gather the data, use big data analysis, classify the data, apply machine learning, like what Dr. Reutzel did, know something about it. When we know, use both model, both machine learning, we know something, then we need to go back, read our uh, physical metallurgy textbooks, and know why metallurgically this is happening. So under one umbrella, if you bring all the expertise, that will be the uh, digital twin in future. Digital twin, uh, this concept, application of digital twin in additive manufacturing is just published this year in this journal, this, uh, this article. Uh, but physically, uh, there is no digital twin for additive manufacturing that we can use, download the package or use, that is not <coughs> available. So there are many companies, they are trying to put together digital twins. So in future, probably, we'll have a digital twin. And this concept is so rapidly developing that many journals are actually publishing special issue on digital twin. Or there are special conferences that are being held for uh, discussing the utility of digital twin and its application in additive manufacturing. So if I uh, summarize, what I have told, there are two important things. One, additive manufacturing that we need to know. We need to make good product that we wouldn't be able to make a few years ago, that we need to make. But when we are trying to make that, there are so many difficulties. And that difficulties are coming because the process is very complex. We do not know the process. This is one thing. And the other thing is how mechanistic model augmented with machine learning in some day, bringing them as digital twins someday in near future. We can solve all these problems by getting more understanding why, what, when, and how. So what I have told about the physics involved and all of those things, if you want to know more, there are two places. One is this review paper by Professor Debroy. And this is our research website where we have deposit depositories of several interesting things that will help uh, all of you, I believe. So that's all from my side. I will be taking any questions from you. Thank you. Thanks very much.